Um, I'm here with my university hat. I'm actually teaching in 45 minutes, some of you, and tomorrow as well. And uh, it's a week of probably, so I know everybody's busy studying. Um, I'm really glad to be here. And, you know, with slightly different, uh, uh, let's say, Mondus operandi that you see me on the undergraduate class. I'm very happy that some of the uh, physics two students are here. Can I see by hands who is taking physics two with me this uh, semester? Great. So this is going to be a slightly different lecture. Um, and who's, who has taken physics with me in the past? Okay. Okay. That's good. I won't ask how many of you have passed the course yet, but uh, that's good, okay? It's like 50% of the audience. Um, so this is about quantum computing. Um, this is where all this um, stuff I, I bore you every Tuesday and Thursday uh, class, which is 19th century physics, as I said. Um, this is more like 21st century physics. This is where the, the research frontier is at the moment of quantum physics and information theory, which is meant in what we call quantum computing. In the next um, half an hour or so, I will try to give you a case. Uh, for the English students, we have a, a, a course at the last year, or the fifth year, which I'm teaching today again at 1 o'clock, which will go a little bit deeper. Uh, in, in, uh, in the context of uh, 12 weeks. This is just a fast forward version of that and a very fast forward version of the whole field. So please do ask questions if you have during the, the, the talk. It's supposed to you know, be interactive and I hope I can uh, give you a taste. So I will start off um, what's my quantum computing and why? Why do we care about it? Then I will mention a little bit about the killer apps. What could be the killer quantum apps when quantum computers come out? And I will end with a race, which is going on at the moment, to build quantum computers, to build the hardware. So why quantum? This is two-year-old data. It has changed already. It's actually even bigger than this. Daily, we produce roughly three exabytes of data every day. X is technically 18. This is roughly 250,000 libraries of US Congress, if anybody has been or seen the picture on, online, or roughly five million laptops like this one, daily. That's the amount of data produced. And this is basically comes from internet use, billions of global internet users tweeting, in Facebook, emails, pictures, videos, documents that we upload on the cloud, we save in our computers, etc. This is a huge, huge amount of data. <coughs> so the, the question is, can we cope? Can we stay in touch with our technology and keep processing this data? The question is, the answer is, if computers continue to evolve as we know them, and that's how we got into this place, uh, we need to double roughly every year in speed and memory. That's called the Moore's law. So if we look at this graph, this is nanometers, by the way, not, not millimeters, this is hypersphere. And these are the decades. Uh, and these are basically the processes produced by the big computing companies. This is roughly how small is the smallest feature in the transistor, in terms of nanometers. So we have 5 nanometers, 10 nanometers, and so on, and micrometers, which is a thousand of a millimeter, 10 micrometers, 5 micrometers, 1 micrometer, this is small. Micrometers, 10 to the minus 6, is a thousand of a, of a, uh, a millimeter. <coughs> The younger, or let's say that you guys probably were born around the, the time of uh, Pentium Pro or Pentium 3. I wrote my thesis 20 years ago in the Pentium 4. And 
and the more senior of us in the audience uh, might recognize 8080 or Intel 286 and so on, which was back in the 80s. As you see, we're hitting what's called the limit of optical lithography very soon. We're actually already there in, the, in terms of the transistor size. Um, we just cannot go smaller than 25 nanometers without taking into account the quantum effects. The transistor, the connection basically that you have between two sides with an insulator, whether the current goes through or not, the question doesn't make sense anymore. You have so much noise because of the quantum effect that we just cannot squeeze any more um, we cannot make smaller transistors, which means Moore's law fails. Moore's law fails means we cannot cope with this data, the exponential increase. The computers will just uh, get slower and slower. And so what do we do with that? How do we, does that mean that computing industry ends and civilization ends with it? Because that's how having civilization is based on computing everywhere. And it's based on the expectation that in two years or three years you're going to get a faster computer because the data and all the programs would be so heavy that your computer slows down. So if that's not the case, what can we do? Well, quantum physics is there. It creates the problem but also creates the solution. Quantum physics allows semiconductors to work. At least how we built computers in the first place. And not only computers, but laser sensors, flash memories, GPS, and a lot of other things. However, what we are talking about, at the moment, we are living what's called the second quantum revolution. We have the ability to go inside the atom, inside the nanoscale, uh, at the nanoscale limit, and manipulate materials uh, one by one atom, one by one electron, one by one photon. So this will allow us, possibly, to circumvent this problem of, of the computing industry. In what way? In, by what's called exploiting two new notions of quantum physics that are not there in classical mechanics. Entanglement and superposition. Entanglement and superposition are very exotic um, notions. You don't see them around. Superposition means that one electron can be two places at the same time. It can be a wave and a particle at the same time. Uh, it can go, you fire an electron on a wall with two holes, it goes through both holes at the same time. Very crazy stuff. But that's how the microcosm, the atomic world, works. And entanglement, as we'll discuss later, is talking about very strongly connected physical systems, even if they are light years apart. And you do something here, and the other particle feels it in the other end of the universe. These two very exotic notions of the quantum world will actually serve us to solve the problem I mentioned earlier. There are four areas in quantum technologies where these exotic notions are applied to build new devices. One is called quantum communication. The other is quantum computing, quantum simulation, and sensing and metrology. I will mainly talk about quantum computing here, which is about solving problems be beyond the reach of classical computers, including manipulating big data, including building, you know, going beyond Moore's law. Communication is about using quantum physics to secure, to build secure communication networks, which quantum computers, when they are built, will break the classical ones. So quantum communication comes actually to save us from quantum computers. As we'll see, and one example of quantum computers later on is that they will break what's called the RSA protocol for cryptography. Every time we use our credit card on the internet, every time you get um, money out of your ATM, there's an encryption, encryption thing going behind based on factorizing large numbers. We'll explain it a little bit more later. Where a quantum computer can break that in seconds, where a classical one takes six months or a year or ten years, depending how big the key is. Quantum simulation is about simulating materials, chemistry, 
the weather, solving specific large problems that classical computers cannot um, tackle. Specialized quantum computers, basically like quantum simulators. And sensors and metrologies about building highly sensitive um, <coughs> detectors for applications in biology, in medicine, um, with very high resolution and that can be used for diagnostics, for example, in, um, you could, if you could measure atom by atom the change in properties of a, of a, of a drug, you could design specific ways to deposit that drug for a specific illness in certain parts of the body without having to get the patient to, you know, swallow a wide range of, of medicine that could damage other parts of the body. This is where this uh, diagnostic, quantum diagnosis comes in. We'll say a little bit more later. But coming back to computing and simulation, um, computers applied in any in any part of the world we live in and the current technology and, and culture. The first application that we are working on at the moment um, are for drug design, as I mentioned, materials with exotic properties, high temperature superconductors, for example, um, financial modeling, I mean, this is the less maybe popular um, approach, for me at least, but there's definitely a lot of interest there, you know, predicting stock markets, etc. Uh, chemistry already mentioned big data, and also in AI, artificial intelligence. Um, where we are at the moment, what's the status and the vision in this field? The technology is about quantum parallelism. The, the, the ability of quantum systems to, to be in more than one state at a time allows us to process information faster. Without having to have parallel processors, you have one processor, but somehow it exists in a quantum superposition of a massive amount of possible states. We'll see a little bit later how that works. The vision is to be able to solve optimization problems, traffic problems, production engineering, grids, I mentioned earlier, markets, data, etc. We're very, very close at the moment. We don't have quantum computers, like outperforming classical computers in general. This is how they look like. I'll, I'll go back a little bit later and explain the hardware. Uh, they definitely don't look like normal computers at the moment. Um, there's a lot of interest by global IT corporations the last four years in, um, in investing and getting labs and university people working in collaboration with them on, on this new kind of technology. The challenge is quantum systems are very fragile. They work at very low temperatures, minus 270 degrees. We'll go back and see that this is basically the whole thing, the chip sits down here and it's not really a chip as we we, we, we think about it in terms of classical computers, but it's, uh, it could be a bunch of atoms trapped in an electromagnetic field that are being manipulated by lasers. And the whole thing has to be cooled down to almost absolute zero. Quantum simulators, as I mentioned earlier, are a bit closer to reality. We have them at the moment. These are specialized quantum computers. Um, not universal, that can solve any problem, but they can solve specific problems, large problems that require a lot of computing power. The, just to have a feeling, imagine you have a, a material and you try to understand its properties, how you're gonna make it tougher, or how can you make, for example, conductivity without resistance. So you can build low, um, low loss wires. We transport electricity using copper. For large distances, we, we, we're losing a lot of energy. Right? Most of the um, energy, uh, a large percentage goes to the environment. If we can design materials that are even superconducting ideally at room temperature, we would solve a huge problem. But to do that, you need to be able to go in the material and solve 
this radical equation for billions and billions of atoms and electrons, Avogadro number as we learned in school, 10 to the 23. At the same time to predict for what type of crystal structure the material will be superconducting. That's an extremely hard problem. It's impossible to solve with normal computers. Quantum simulators can do that. And the way they do it is you construct an artificial quantum system in the lab that mimics the complicated real crystal and then you model that using quantum uh, approaches. Um, we do have early um, proof of principles in this case for, for chemistry, for fertilizer, drugs, like uh, medicine, and uh, it's something that we're also working with collaboration with some um, companies in, at the academic level, you know, research papers, not, not any other uh, kind of collaboration. To go back to this uh, speed up, just to give you a feeling. If you have what we call qubits, what are qubits? Qubits are quantum bits. It can be 0 or 1. Let me go back to that. Maybe I'll come back to this. Imagine you have three memory slots, three atoms in this case. Classically, I could store a number that looks like 0, 1, 1, or 1, 0, 1, or in total, I could do how many? Two, two, two here, two here, two here, eight possible combinations. But at any time, I could only put one. I can either have zero, 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 or I could change my atom. In this case, the electron circulates around the atom in this way. In this second case, it circulates this way. In normal computers, these are small magnets, magnetic materials that are pointing up or down. At zero or one. Here I'm using an atom. If I'm at the classical physics level with three bits, I can only have one of these eight combinations. Either zero, 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 or one, zero, zero. I can't have anything else. Quantum mechanically, I can actually have the electron in a quantum superposition. It can actually circulate in what we call um, in a superposition of these two states. This is crazy, but that's, that's how nature is. And hundreds of experiments the last hundred years of quantum physics have verified this. So, in that case, I can actually have a, what's called a superposition of registers as well. I can have all eight possibilities of the memory of the processor encoded in my physical system at the same time. So if I do processing here, I have parallel processing. And, and what that allows me to do, it allows me to process algorithms that are impossible to do otherwise in what we call polynomial time. So let's just have a, a feeling. This is source algorithm, is one of the first algorithms written in almost 50 years ago, exploiting this quantum superposition uh, to, do, uh, to do something useful. Let me talk about the memory first, because they jump from the memory, then we look at, at, the, at the algorithm. So 5 qubits, 32. 9 qubits, with 3 we said 8, right? 3 makes 8. 4 makes 16. 5, 32. 9, 5, 12. 35 qubits, only 35 qubits. Like like my, my our phones or our computers these days have you know gigabytes of memory. Just with 35, I have roughly four gigs of RAM. 10 to 10 possible numbers, possible states that the qubit can encode. If each of these numbers takes a few bytes of memory, it's roughly four gigs. 50 is 10 to the 15. Just 50 qubits, 2 to the 50 is a huge number. That's roughly, if you can process the power, 100 petabytes and 100 petaflops of processing power. With 300 qubits, 
you're larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So we're talking about exponential speed up. That power is there at the atomic level. Sounds like um, exotic, but it is. How do we get it out? How do we exploit these um, possibilities to solve real problems? That's basically the job of what's called quantum algorithm engineer. It's a new discipline, it's a new um, kind of, uh, let's say, the job in abroad. Uh, quantum software engineer, which is basically designing algorithms that use this um, quantum parallels. It's not a trivial problem. And the second part is to build the hardware. Like, that is where the physicists mostly come in, and quantum engineers. Let, let, me, look, let me go back to this uh, first algorithm, one of the first ones, source algorithm, to give you an example, a solid example. The math behind source algorithms are a bit complicated, you have to, you know, take a six months final year course, like the one we teach in IMI, the fifth year to understand it, but the, the numbers are easy to grasp. We don't have to go to the maths. RSA encryption, again, for the non-specialists, it's just a way of uh, encrypting pins in large numbers, just to give you a very rough version. So 15 is 3 times 5, 20 is 2 times 2 times 5. If I give you a very large number and I tell you a very large key, and I tell you, find the prime factors, factorize it. If I give you a handle, you can still think a little bit divide. If I give you something which is five, three digits big, four digits big, six digits big, the time it takes you to, to break it, like to find the factors, goes exponential with the size of the number, classically. This is where RSA encryption works. So if you have 453 big keys in these RSA systems, this is what we're using currently at the moment. Uh, in a lot of online transactions, etc. This can be, you can crack that, what we call intensity in your years, which is basically a one giga flow machine, a large kind of uh, workstation, in 9,000 hours. But it can be done, which is roughly a year. Of course, if you do a supercomputer, like, you know, with paper flops, you can do it faster, you can do it in a few hours. Source algorithm will take an hour, assuming you have roughly 800 qubits, and each gate takes you 10 nanoseconds. But that's not the, the first line is not really the, uh, the wow line, actually it's the second and the third one. You double the number of bits, you make your key twice as big, then classically you go from 10 CPU years to 2,000, you go exponentially. Although you only double the key, the time the classical algorithm will take will, will take exponentially larger. The quantum computer will do it from one to five hours. You go to 1,024 bits, which is state of the art at the moment. This is what we are using. That's why you know the internet in quotas is safe. And then banks and etc. and the whole civilization has all collapsed. Because it takes a million CPU years. It's unbreakable. We don't have much even 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 the fastest computer in the world at the moment can break this. It will take you years. Ten hours. So this you see the speed up. Of course, hardware requirements. To do that you need and actually 4,000 qubits. It doesn't sound very much, <coughs> but it is actually. You need roughly 4,000 atoms well controlled, trapped, and do gates, and, and you know, control the errors and the decoherence, as we call it. And 100,000 gates. It's very cool, but it's not something we're going to have the next two, three years. We don't know in five or ten years, technology evolves very fast, uh, but it's definitely not a short-term killer application. So at the moment, 
you know, I say cryptography is safe. So what is, what is a killer app? What can be done in the next three to five years? Because physics usually, and this is where we go from physics to engineering. In physics, the physics of the 1910 led to semiconductors of the 1940s and 50s, 30, 40 years ahead. But now I'm talking about within the, the decade. One application is, as I mentioned in the earlier, quantum simulation. Quantum simulation is much closer to reality. I mentioned two or three cases. Chemistry and materials modeling. At the moment, one third of supercomputing time and supercomputers spend on this. Simulating materials, simulating chemistry, reactions, etc. With a few hundred qubits, not 4,000 qubits, with a hundred or 200 qubits, you can solve these problems. Pharmaceuticals, medical simulations, high PC, even a very lame example, this is for the engineers in the audience, this is how we make fertilizer, nitrogen fixation, liposome. To make fertilizer, we're using at the moment a technology which is 1909 invented. Because we just don't have the computing power to do more. And we're using 400 Celsius, 200 atmospheres, pressure, massive factories, and we put them all together and we're trying to make fertilizer out of you know, carbon dioxide and, um, and nitrogen. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of electricity, a lot of uh, oil, and but if we could simulate, if we could do what catalysts do, bacteria, that they do it in room temperature, right? You throw your, you collect your food waste outside, it's kind of fermenting the process naturally by bacteria. They act as catalysts and they bring the requirement of this high temperatures and very energy consuming reaction to, to, to the minimum. If we could reproduce the full chemical reaction details on a computer, then we could actually design it and save all that energy. And I can only take 100 qubits. I'm just giving you a hint at the moment we're at 45 qubits hardware. I'll let with the hardware later. So we're like five, five qubits below where somewhere here. 50, just to keep a number, 50 is the, the threshold of outperforming classical computers. You go more than 100 petabytes, more than 100 petaflops. We are not there yet, but we are above 55. Another killer application, quantum opti optimization programs. Again, for it's an engineering crowd, Everything we do in engineering has to do with optimization. Optimizing functions, finding a minimum in logistics, in finance, operation research. In a very simple example, imagine you have just two parameters and you're trying to find the minimum of this function. You have a two-dimensional landscape with hills and valleys and the solution of your problem can be any problem, a traffic problem, uh, finance problem is finding that optimal minimum. Quantum computers do that very well. I do not require thousands of qubits to do it. There is a way to map this problem, what we call a quantum spin problem, and then the natural, by cooling the spin lattice down, the ground state, the lowest energy state, is the solution of this one. This is very, very active and very uh, close to realization at the moment. And of course there is quantum neural networks or quantum AI, quantum artificial intelligence. Every time you switch on your Siri or your and you talk to here and you you know you Google something, there is a learning process behind in deep learning for example, where somehow you might have noticed that 
your computer starts more and more every year understanding you. It sounds weird as well and borderline. When I'm, if you feel it understands you 100%, then maybe you need to have a break. But I'm, uh, I'm talking about learning your, your choices. You go on Facebook, you go on Google somehow. It's much easier these days than it was in the past to, to, to get a feeling and find what you're saying. That's because there is a training, there is a, what we call an AI training behind, and based on the input you put, the machine gives you specific outputs which are optimized for you. For very large problems, or very big problems, in spite of the progress which is used these days in artificial intelligence and neural networks, we still have some issues. 20 years ago, you would call an automatic machine and I would say, can I talk to Mr. Smith, please? Automatic. And then they would reply back, Dr. Parker is not in. It was <laughs> completely off. These days, it's like almost perfect, right? You, sometimes you don't even know. You play with, with Siri, and you know, I mean, it feels like it's real. Scary, but that's how technology is. Still, for large problems, large data, they don't do very well. Quantum, quantum neural networks can do very well, both for classical data and quantum data. I don't want to go into detail, but you can have classical data attacked by classical problems, or classical data and have a quantum <coughs> algorithm. This pattern recognition, for example, right? You have a lot of images, and you try to recognize faces, or people, or it's an animal, or it's a person, or it's a man or a woman. Um, because you can use a quantum neural network to process it very fast. Or you can have quantum data, as I mentioned earlier, chemical reactions, uh, material science, where you can use classical machine learning, or fully quantum quantum approach, which is also very interesting. The one that is probably more relevant to, to you is the classical data using quantum approaches, where you have all these speedups in pattern recognition, as you mentioned, face recognition, and so on. Um, there is a lot of interest recently, worldwide, in this um, basic science. I mean, for engineering uh, level, the funding that engineering receives compared to what physics and basic science receive is always much smaller because it's much easier to convince politicians to fund medic, medicine or engineering applications than physics applications. But in the last five years, this has changed for quantum computing. The European Union decided last year, after the uh, BRAIN project and the Graphene project, these are the flags, these are the big initiatives to fund research at the European level. They, every 10 years they change. They decide out of many, many different choices where to, what to support. For the next 10 years, it will be quantum computing, quantum technologies. There's roughly 2 billion euros focused research on that. The Brain Project has another three, four years left. Um, and the thing is also ending, the next one will be quantum. In the US, of course, in, in, in England, Australia, China is coming in very big. I heard from Anne that you're planning to introduce Chinese, which is, I think, a good choice. I'm not sure it's nice to live in China, but it doesn't have to, to learn the language. Maybe you can have a placement there for a year. I don't know whether it can last longer, but it's, a, it's an interesting place to be and visit, but maybe not to live for too long. Um, Singapore, small country, um, five million people, but the economy and the structure is more efficient than here. We also invest in, in this quite a bit. Japan, Australia, and so on. A lot of private companies, uh, not only the big ones like um, Google, IBM, and so on, the ones that you would expect. But Airbus is coming in big these days for optimization problems, for you know fluid dynamics problems. Um, 
and a few others, British Telecom, Buddhism, NDT, etc. And I will end with a quantum hardware, which is uh, how, I mean, all this is nice and the algorithms and so on and the software, but how do you really build this? And how, well, how far are we from, the, from uh, realizing quantum computers? How do they look like? Or as I say, uh, how to build the Vladimir and the race for supremacy. Quantum supremacy. This is a, maybe a little bit an uh, unfortunate term. Sometimes we call it quantum advantage to distinguish it from the, you know, all this weird white supremacy. So this is just, uh, has no relation to that. Um, quantum hardware. So what types of hardware we have? We have Trapped ions, superconductors, molecules, quantum dots, and neutral atoms. These are all quantum systems, as I mentioned earlier, that we can go and, and manipulate the particles one by one, and we have full control in quantum labs. These are the prototypes of quantum processes. Up here is how well we can control and manipulate them, and store information, and do algorithms. And, and here is how many of them we have. As I said, you need at least 50 fully controllable ones to do something that outperforms classical computers. With trapped ions and superconducting qubits, we can do up to 20, 30, it's getting there. 45 not done very well. There's a lot of errors in uh, dissipation, decoherence. Like the, the, the qubits, basically, the atom as it's circulating, the, the electron just drops down. We learned at school that you excite an atom after a while, the electron comes back and emits a photon. That's an error. Your one became a zero without really, you know, you wanting that. And that creates an error in the algorithm. So you need to be able to protect that. You need to keep the electron up in the excited state for them as long as possible. And down here is the neutral atoms, we can have millions of them trapped in uh, electromagnetic in lasers, but we can't really go inside and manipulate one by one. So it slightly, you know, comes from the other side. How they look like these are prototypes, quantum computers from uh, some of the companies. Most of them are done with universities. Um, this is a Google one, 9 qubit chip. I'll say a few more about this. The IBM superconducting chips. Rigetti is a spin off company from Yale. Again, on superconducting. And INQ is a Washington based US of Maryland spin off. The Google one, just to have a feeling a bit closer, you can imagine this is a chip. It looks it's uh, roughly 10 millimeters, one centimeter. You can actually grab it in your hand. It looks like a SIM, like a, a telephone SIM, mobile phone. Each of these wires are superconducting wires that bring in signals. These are nine qubits, nine quantum bits that can be in two states at a time. You can manipulate this, sending microwave pulses in the chip. And these guys can actually encode up to two to the nine possible combinations. Far from the quantum supremacy level again, but still you can do interesting things with them. Um, this is something we've done back in with the group, uh, my group here, collaboration with the group in Singapore. They gave us an award for that. That's fine. Now, what does this sit on? For this to work, it has to be a minus 273 degrees. Otherwise, it's not superconducting and it, there's no quantum superposition. You can either have 0, 0, 0, 0 or one, one of the nine, two to the nine states. To do that, you need to put it in a huge freeze, dilution freeze. This is how they call they look like this. And it has liquid helium and you embed the whole control system the plaquette sits here on the bottom, 
So down, down there, you start from room temperature, and down there is minus 270 degrees. And you need to keep it at that temperature to work. And just to, for parallelism, I give you a picture of the ENIAC in 1914. Six, one of the first electro, electronic computers that was called at the time, with lamps, vacuum tubes. It was a very complicated, very large object, similarly to this. Um, it could do like 500 flows for 80,000 vacuum cubes with 30 tons in weight. And just to get a feeling, the core duo at uh, 3.2 gigahertz was like 3 gigaflows nowadays. But everything started from there. And that, for its era, for 1946, was could do the work of maybe 200 humans calculating projectile trajectories for the space program and also for the, you know, the rocket program between the uh, US and, and, and USSR at the time. It was a very good, a very fast cal calculator. 500 knots might not seem very much, but at that time was huge. Could solve the problem that nobody else could solve. And that's exactly where we are at the moment. With 50 qubits, as we said earlier, we can break RSA, uh, sorry, we can solve optimization problems. With 1,000 qubits or 2,000, we can break RSA. Another more exotic quantum processor is the ion trap quantum processor. And this is the last few slides. These are atoms trapped. You come with a laser, you send a pulse, you put the electron in a state that you zero. You send another pulse, you can make it one. Very, very different than, than the chip based technology, but equally efficient at the moment. Ions and superconductors at the moment are the leading technologies. Or you can send kind of a halfway pulse and create this proposition. And this is where the quantumness is. And you can do that for any qubit. And the qubits are interacting, they are atoms trapped. They are repelling each other because the ions, every time one absorbs a photon, it kicks and kicks the other one, and this way you can make logic. You can make XOR or control, control gates. There is a race at the moment going on who is going to build the first one. Uh, both in hardware, 20 qubits is the most recent and operational one by IBM. We did the 9 qubits fully controlled last year and that brought us to science. Here you don't have full control, there's still quite a bit of noise, there's a lot of errors happening. Um, to seven <laughs> questions? Questions at all, just maybe one or two we have time for. Okay. Thank you very much.